This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, January 25th, 2024. Uh, we have as our topic, the second rev on governance, which I will explain momentarily. First, I'm gonna turn on the transcript. There we go. And um, I'm really happy you're here. It's a, uh, this is an exciting topic, and I think we have a lot of um, a lot of things to cover. Um, Ken Homer is probably not going to be on this call uh, because he got COVID a couple of days ago, and it was uh, you know that wouldn't be a problem because he could be isolated at home. But he was feeling really crappy and running a pretty high temperature, so I don't think he's going to make the call. Uh, he and I are interested in organizing a separate set of calls on this topic that would probably run at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific uh, after this uh, after this slot on Thursdays for four weeks starting next week. And at the end of this call, I'm going to do a show of hands to see if we should even try doing that, uh, if there's any interest here. But I would love to have some 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 wiggle room, some spare time to actually go deeper into the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll explain that again uh, at the very end of the call. Cool. And um, the start of uh, the start of this is really a question of hey what is a good form of governance for a group, a large group of people? Uh, which means uh, some people say, well, it's either democracy the way we have it or socialism or communism and look how horrible those have been, which is a false dichotomy. There are really many different ways for a group of people to come together and make sense of the world. Uh, in fact, in my brain, there's a, a topic called variants of anarchism, and there are some 20 odd varieties just of anarchism, which we managed to write off entirely as a terrible, chaotic thing that nobody should ever go look at. And it turns out that Bookchin and others who were the like were anarchists were really trying to figure out how do groups of people come together and govern each other without creating massive, uh, heavy structures that that a lot of people then wind up protesting about. So we had a great conversation two weeks ago. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for reminding me about the recordings and the transcripts. I haven't uploaded them all yet properly into the Mattermost, but I completely got stuck in my process of uploading and, and reporting into the, the channel uh, for the recordings. So I will finish those and I will then put these up uh, after, which means they'll kind of be nice and together. Uh, but I, I totally messed that up. Uh, and I wanted to ask one question for us to answer in the chat, just as we warm up and get into this conversation. Uh, and that was as follows. Um, what would you wish to find? And I'll, I'll type this into the chat uh, and I'll give us a minute to, to sit and think about it. What would you wish to discover, find, or take away from uh, discussions about governance? What is the thing, the thing, how, how what words would you put around uh, the thing you would love to take away from fruitful discussions around governance? And I'll type that in the chat, and then let's go quiet for a minute. And then, uh, as you wish, you don't. We don't have to wait and and you know pause and go, but uh, put them in the chat as you come up with them. So Dave, we're going quiet for about a minute. I just put a question in the chat, which we are going to answer uh, in the chat. Jake, idealistically, is totally good here. Thank you.
Love that. Raise your hand if you'd like a little more time. I think we've heard from most everybody. Not quite. Awesome. So let me just go back and uh, read through them. So Eric writes, I want to better understand the issues people have with the governance model as outlined in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Gil, Gil, imagination, Anastasia, inspiration, new models, unconventional thinking around governance. Uh, I wrote, what's working? How might we improve or update our current forms of governance? Jake, if I'm speaking idealistically, I'd love to have some kind of epiphany that helps me see a new angle on the question. Stacy, new questions to think about. Eric, again, sharing a website represent.us. Gil, what can we learn from Rojava? Uh, what can we bring to our worlds here? Uh, Dave, how can governance evolve to support regeneration of living systems like bar regions and all the members therein, rivers, trees, etc.? Pete, I would like people to get an idea of the dramatic range of scales where we need governance from a handful of people who know each other well to a massively heterogeneous hundreds of millions to billions of people with very different concerns and sensibilities. Sorry, I got to stop and give that a, a heart. Um, then Jose, how not to fix but reimagine society in a way that is actionable. Doug, a form of governance that makes us feel larger and open, not smaller and scared. Love that. Uh, Love them all, actually. And Patty, what landmarks can we watch for that might indicate that a new model is setting us up for a new version of the old model? So beware of falling back into the old ruts, Patty. Like, like shiny new object looks great. We go over there and oops, we've just re reincarnated the old system that we didn't like. Uh, totally agree. And way too much change is like that, in particular because people don't particularly like change and people who control systems managed to reroute things so that they work. Um, recently, Jerry, there was- uh, I think you missed Klaus's. Pardon? Oh, sorry, where's- uh, uh, And Klaus's facility conversations between population groups based on trust. Thank you, you're totally right. I didn't, I, my eyes skipped over it. Um, there've been, there's been a whole bunch of talk about uh, the civil war recently. It was an anniversary of something, I'm forgetting what, uh, but also I, re I subscribed to Heather Cox Richardson, who's really, really good. and. What happens after the Civil War uh, with, at first, sort of Reconstruction era and then the backlash and the KKK and Jim Crow and everything else is so heartbreaking. It's really so heartbreaking. Like, we, we fight a war, this, you know, that many uh, Americans die, and then we just run right back into the same old ruts in so many ways. Uh, so how, do we, how, do, how does one prevent that? So let me pause for a second and we'll start kind of scatter, scattered wherever, uh, whatever rang here that you would like to take us into the topic. As I said, uh, Ken wrote me a note after the last call proposing a structure for some more structured calls, which I really like, which I'd like to do separate from these calls. The, the structure he proposed seemed like more than we should do within the OGM standing call framework. It would take longer and so forth. So we're gonna take four Thursdays uh, if there's if there's interest and and sort of focus on that and try to bring more people to the conversation, uh, so let me just pause and see what part of this is uh, is active for you. I I, I was just going to kind of reaffirm the topic, Jerry. We've been doing a a weekly series on regeneration and governance in the GRC, and a lot of the conversations have been really productive. And I mean, I, I kind of feel like we're on the, you know, the edge of, of a pretty important transitions in governance technology, if you will. And, and that, you know, this, this is one of the paradigm shifts we're experiencing is how do we evolve governance to cope with the, you know, opportunities and issues that we're facing going forward and other, you know, and, and, you know, the last one was a couple hundred years ago. So this, you know, it'd be nice to have a good one. That's right. Within our lifetimes, that'd be awesome. Um, Anastasia and I had a, a first conversation just before this call, and she said a lovely thing at the end of it, which was, in five years, uh, governance will be the new climate change. Like, we, we won't be focusing on climate change the way we're so focused right now, hopefully because we've dealt with it better, and we will be having all sorts of interesting conversations around governance. Anastasia, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or... Sure. Thanks, Jay. Well, not quite. I, I still think that we should uh, and we will be focused uh, on climate. But governance is just such an important variable of also solving for that problem. And so, you know, my invitation to discuss in this group would also be to understand what are the models that could 
uh, open us up to governance beyond national borders and what could planetary models of governance look like as so many of the things that you know in my foundation we called hyper objects are concerned like are of concern to more than just one nation you know if we take himalayas uh that affects the lives of three billion people and you know china pakistan india everybody is involved but somehow we have not managed to figure out a way to govern that in a collective sort of way and uh, in terms of the planetary object that uh, an object like himalayas is or danube the river danube or the alps so many of these hyper objects require new systems of governance, new understanding of how these things could be brought together and thinking uh, in planetary terms and beyond uh, just the national borders. That's one. Secondly, I would also like uh, to, I don't remember who wrote it, but uh, the narrative of regeneration and understanding governance items, not as objects, but as agents. For example, you know, if river or a tree could be an engine in governance, how could that relationship look like? And how do we switch from uh, object-based model of governance to, to uh, an agent-based model of governance? So that, that would be my, my two um, suggestions, understanding the planetary uh, governance systems and understanding the relations between the agents rather than objects. Jill, I see your, your hand up. You wanted to add something. Thank you. Uh, before, before passing to Gil, oh, I, I, that's okay. Before passing to Gil, I also want to say um, religion is not out of scope for this conversation at all. And uh, we've had conversations here in these calls before about maybe the resacralization of the world as a way of getting people to see each other and to govern differently. And, and so this doesn't need, to, we don't need to limit ourselves to voting, democracy, governance, alternatives to democracy, what would replace how people bubble up a decision. That doesn't need to be the, 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 the narrow scope of this conversation. We can range pretty widely because uh, religions are governance models, uh, I think very much. So go ahead, Gild and Klaus. Yeah, I want to, I want to, um, I want to poke at the term governance and, and open the frame a little bit here because I think we're in trouble as soon as we start using that word. Uh, and the problem is is expressed in the uh, clip from Etymology Etym Online that I posted. Uh, you know, the first uh, the first phrase there is to rule with authority is the way that we think about governance, uh, about rules, commands, etc. Um, but the etymology goes in a different direction. And Norbert Wiener uh, contributed to this problem with his book Cybernetics in what Jerry 1948 or something like that. I know you know, uh, and uh, seminal work, and it was subtitled The Science of Communication and Control, I think in Humans and Animals or something like that, I forget the whole subtitle. But he said communications and control, uh, which I've always thought of as a mistranslation. And if you look at the etymology, it's actually about communications and coordination. Uh, cybernetics comes from, um, comes from the Greek for kibernon, to steer or pilot a ship, um, to guide or to govern. Uh, and so guidance is different than govern as we think about it in the West and coordination is different than control. Uh, and to me, that's the root of the issue that we're looking at here. Uh, one of the ways to coordinate activity among humans is with governance. Um, there are many ways of doing governance, some of them more dominating, some more horizontal. Uh, but I really wanna keep that frame open because uh, coordination uh, seems to me to be an inevitable necessity. Control is an option that we use sometimes, default to sometimes. Um, and uh, uh, for me, the touchstone is always the living world to look at how, you know, wh what can we learn from 3.8 billion years of open source R&D? Um, and what I see there is a lot of coordination, a lot of symbiosis, a lot of mutual exchange, um, um, very little of what we think about as governance in the modern Western sense. So I want to, for me, I want to open the conversation up in that direction as well. Um, and I, I like things like self-governance and collaborative governance and sort of modifications of it. So I've kind of stuck with governance here and I have a whole riff on the difference between large big G government and little g governance where I make some points like you're making, but I've been sticking with governance, although I love collaboration, coordination, a bunch of those other words are very, very happy words for me. So 
Um, thank you for that. And, uh, and I'm fine with you sticking with governance and just uh, serving you notice that I'm going to fight you periodically about that. I love that. That sounds awesome. Um, Klaus, then Doug. Yeah, maybe along the same lines uh, as uh, Gil was just uh, referring to, when you look at the evolution of governance, so in, in Europe, uh, for example, during the feudal times, you, know, you had the royal class make decisions which became increasingly uh, more difficult to execute on and to, and to live with uh, as the as society evolved into a more technology driven and a more complex form. So you had, I mean, for example, there's a story about Hamburg, you know, Hamburg used to be a city state. Um, and it was dominated by uh, by royals who made some really bad decisions that impacted the economy and it impacted the well being of the of of the working class. Um, and they came to a an agreement where you would have like a city council that had a a, a specific role of uh, governance uh, in. Uh, uh, based on permission you know, from uh, the, the royal class, the feudal uh, class, um, but based on logic and, and uh, you know, what's best for the commons and what's in that sense best for everybody. And so the, the, even today, when you, when you look at the role of, of government, um, you, know, you have the working class with very specific uh, rules and, and, uh, and needs. Uh, and then you have the elites who dominate the the um, uh, controlling capital and control and instruments of control um, with conflicting, often conflicting interests. And the government has is sort of is supposed to sit in the middle uh, in a negotiating role that keeps the commons intact and that uh, takes care of the needs of you know, the working class. And we're talking about education, healthcare, you know, things of that sort that are required in a modern society. Once you once once the government gets compromised by one or the other group, uh, it loses its negotiating position. And that's I think is where we are. We have lost the negotiating position of governance uh, to to uh, to work within interest groups. Um, and it's dominated by by obviously those that are more powerful and control mechanisms, you know, of uh, uh, for for the economy. So I, I think uh, uh, I I see the I see here a negotiating position and a role of uh, um, of protecting the commons. So, uh, you know, if that's maybe the best term to say. Yeah, those are great words. I love those words. Um, or stewarding or shepherding the commons or curating the commons or somehow being guardians of the commons. Those are all great words. Uh, Klaus, when you mentioned feudal Europe, you reminded me of a really interesting book, Amsterdam, The History of the World's Most Liberal City, uh, which says that uh, Holland was one of the few places that didn't go feudal during those ages. And a part of it was uh, polders and a part of it was herring. And I'm forgetting the rest of the book, but Polders means that half of half of the Netherlands has reclaimed land and they had to figure out how to cooperate and anybody screwing up could flood the land and, and like ruin the country. So there was a, a different ethos about civic participation in, in Holland over time that came out of that. And then separately, um, uh, some uh, some uh, Dutch merchant uh, in, invented um, the, the herring bus, which was a, a beamy uh, vessel. And then they invented a, a way of processing herring that, herring that kept the spleen and the liver in the herring. And the enzymes from those organs would make a sweeter herring. So Holland herring was like premium luxury goods back in the day. And those merchants got wealthy. But there were a lot of them. There wasn't, it, there wasn't just like, like the herring king. There were a bunch of people who, who figured this out and got wealthy. That mechanism was part of what kept Holland from going feudal, which and there was a different dynamic in other countries that led, you know, into feudalism with kings and 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 all of that sort of thing. It's not like like uh, the Netherlands didn't have kings also, but but I, I think that there are vagaries and twists and accidents and conjunctures. And there's another interesting book of history that talks about uh, conjunctures and accidents and all that. I'll, I'll see if I can remember that one. That lead to different forms of governance and to different kinds of ethic or spirit of collectivism or not 
uh, all around the world. And I think that we have limited and, and a narrow knowledge of these things often. Giving is exactly it. Thanks, Pete. Uh, that's exactly the term of how you process herring that makes it taste better. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass to Doug C. Okay, uh, Jerry, first, you're talking so fast, it's awfully hard to parse your thoughts. And in real time, you can't hit pause and rewind, can you? No. Uh, okay. So I would just say, slow down, because it's all good, right. but it's unprocessable. Uh, so here's my thought. In another project I've been working on, my Garden World project, I've come across the difference between governance and civilization. Uh, governance implies a state with boundaries, with rules and regulations. A civilization is a much deeper, wider, more open, more fluid, and actually more interesting structure. And probably for the things we're concerned about, civilization is the playing field we need to be in, uh, not the, uh, the state. So I'll stop there. That's fascinating to me because I've been turned off the word civilization lately by a bunch of books, including Against the Grain. And for me, governance does not have to imply a state. It just means that there's some coordination mechanism for people to thrive. It does not imply national boundaries, nations, anything. Nation states are not, for me, under the umbrella of governance. And civilized has become a pejorative term for me. Does that map to what, what you're experiencing or, or how you see them at all? Well, I recognize the issues. Um, I think that governance does imply uh, rules and regulations, uh, some kind of culture of those things, where civilization is more open. And I agree that civilization is a problem, but certainly governance is also. And But the fact that the two are different gives us leverage points that we might normally avoid. Thank you. And and what you said and what Gil said earlier, I think are, are things to watch out for, basically rocks on the shore of this conversation, which I appreciate everybody alerting us to. Um, Pete then Dave. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, I like where we're kind of poking at the edges of the concept of governance. Um, I, I, I feel like I might caution us a little bit about uh, allergies or, or sensitivities to particular <laughs> words. And maybe the, the way to kind of navigate that is to rest easily with a word um, and ask, you know, okay, so when you say governance, are we talking about, you know, a government or are we talking about co-regulation or, you know, what, what in there? Um, I, th I think that, and and so now having said that, I my uh, I have a, tr a little bit of a problem when we start talking about governance rather than co-regulation, because for me, um, I don't have a word a problem with the word in particular, but it it kind of telescopes back in time for me to, um, uh, for me as a, a a U.S. citizen, you know, living in 2024, it. I, I have a history of governance, the American history of governance back to, you know, the mid 1700s, something like that. And, uh, and then my brain starts to go, okay, well, you know, we, out of the different, you know, three or four different possibilities, we picked democracy and then, you know, we, we wanted represent representational democracy and, you know, and, and then it, it narrows the choice of my thinking down a lot. Um, and so I kind of have to unpack that. And it's like, you know, representational democracy was a, kind of a quick hack for a country that had uh, very poor communication technology compared to what we do now, uh, very poor bookkeeping and accounting technology, um, and a lot of homogeneity. So the governance, the government governance uh, model of you know, 1780 uh, America was, um, okay, let's, you know, let's get a representational vote from all the white male landowners and we'll call it good, you know, we'll kind of tally it up and call it good. And that's, it's a, I mean, it, the whole thing is clever and all that, you know, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that, but it comes from a completely different time in history. Um, so back to kind of what I said at the beginning in the chat, you know, the, uh, 
it's not like we have, a, even in the U.S., it's not like we have a situation where you have like three or four levels of government. You know, you have your your city and your county and your state and your your country. Even in the U.S., we have hundreds or thousands of levels of scale and diff differences in homogene homogeneity where it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to collect, you know, 300, 400 million people into um, Republicans and Democrats and have that fight. You know, it's like, what, what are we even doing? So, um, so for me, I appreciate that we're talking about governance and where I, where I want to talk more or where I want to have that discussion go is towards uh, co-regulation -re and lots of levels of, of scale, thousands of levels of scale and decentralizing decision-making, uh, talking a lot more about uh, negotiation and disagreements and compromises and agreements between all those different levels and different kinds of people and things like that, right? So if that's what governance means, I'm super happy. And when governance doesn't mean that, when we're not dealing with the fact that we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of different little groups and constituencies in, in the U.S., or then to scale it up, you know, millions of different kinds of constituencies. Um, uh, to Anastasia's point, um, human and non-human, you know, some of them are biological systems, some of them are geological systems, some of them are kind of, you know, what we call, what we're starting to call bioregions, um, big, chunky, you know, parts of the world that, that need help and need agency in our in our discussions and decisions. That's kind of where I want us to go, right? To, to expand our thinking into a space that I think we forget that it's so big. Um, it's not just, you know, uh, a couple thousand white guys uh, in the 1700s. Uh, thank you for expanding the roominess of our topic by a lot. Really appreciate that, Pete. Uh, Dave, then Jose. Uh, yeah, gosh, where do you dive into the middle of this, huh? But, well, so, and, and Pete, I've ended up kind of trying to think of the governance issue as, uh, I think maybe kind of like what Doug, uh, who was it Doug that was saying, the, the, it's, it's how we cooperate. It's like there's, there's rules and processes that allow humans to cooperate. And I've always assumed that we were cooperating so that we could make life better, right? And we, I got pushed back on in this group a little bit about whether that's growth or not and whether that's a good thing. And I'm still chewing on that one a lot. But but the, my notion is that governance is how we coordinate our activities so that we could make the, our, our collective lives better, the, the, the global the global life better. And, the, and governance, quote, just is the category of technology we use to do that kind of thing. And, and one of my kind of recent realizations, I think getting to your point, I mean, I wouldn't say democracy was a quick hack. It clearly took several hundred years to develop and we're still working on it, right? Um, but I don't know if it's the last technology leap that we're gonna be making. And I do think one of the fundamental changes is that we're gonna have to see governance more as a living system. It is a web of interacting decision-making processes. It's not, you know, three executive branches over this with the states, you know, coordinating cities. It's much more complicated than that. And and I think that our, you know, our our vision, our understanding of these living systems and seeing kind of into that web is something that we're learning to do right now. I mean, it certainly wasn't something I was taught in public policy school. Um, you know, where you had to learn politics and you know, policy and you were being a technocrat and you were gonna solve problems and stuff. Um so I, I just feel like, you know, and then this is this these ideas are emerging, right? So we're starting to see the possibilities of the adjacent possible for, for new governments of governance approaches. Um and so the notion of, well, we're we're gonna have somehow have a, a biosphere that doesn't that crosses many national boundaries that still needs to have cohesive kind of uh investment because it's an asset that we want to kind of continue to grow and improve. Um, that's the new challenge. Right. And that's why we're talking about this stuff. Love that, Dave. I think in the previous call, I mentioned that I, I, on my wish list of things would be a kind of a playful game where we started uh, to try to collaborate on bioregional and watershed boundaries, pretending that there are no national boundaries, and then just make that ever more functional and turn up the volume and how it works and kind of get people to step over and volunteer into a new way of governing, making governments obsolete because this actually would work better.
but it would have to start as a low key game. It would have to start as something that's relatively playful and not that serious. Or you can just look at nation, nation states as another beast playing in the living system of governance, along with multinational corporations and terrorist organizations and I don't know, whatever else, right? I mean, yep. I don't know if imagining them away is one strategy, but I, I kind of suspect another strategy is just to see them as one of the uh, actors in this very complex system. Love that. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, then Anastasia. And wait, yeah. Jose was in, in the you... queue. Jose, did you drop, drop out? No, I'm here. I think I got skipped somehow. Uh, no, you're, somehow your hand went down. So please, let's go Jose, then Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to second what uh, Pete said, but also everyone else uh, that's commented on the word governance. Um, I think it does influence how we see what we're talking about. And, and I think it does so in a negative way. Um, we're so used to the idea that in order to govern, we need to have rules. And therefore, we need to have people who create those rules, hold up those rules, and so on and so forth. And I wonder if it's time for us to sort of take a step down and think about whether the way that we really um, regulate our society, um, but not govern, uh, necessarily is is through a different set of mechanisms other than rules and and or in addition to rules and and that sort of questioning the first principles of what we might call governance of how does governance work within you know we we've talked a lot about nature within life um, it's not the way we've done it. We've created all of these kind of logical, rational processes. And I wonder if if that's what we need to take a step back from and question that. And then from there, build up. Because I think we're trying to adjust what we've got rather than going down to some kind of first principles that can guide us on the way back up towards something new. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Kevin, then Anastasia. Yeah, <clears throat> two things. In, in the initiative I've talked about, the working on the rights of nature and some carbon tax stuff locally, uh, we're not incorporated and we're not uh, uh, a 501c3. We don't have a fiscal sponsor, but we're having to fire somebody uh, who he brings anxiety and fear and wants to uh, dig up the foundation when we've decided that's the foundation and we need to move on. And we just realized that we're, we, we have a, an ordinance that we are ready for the town of Black Mountain to look at. And we've looked at other ordinances and a great Warren Wilson student. And we can't have this guy in the room when we're going forward because he, he suddenly just gets, oh my God, you know, and, and whatever his anxiety is, he, he wants to, to, to dig up the foundation when we want to build a bridge. And so we're having to do that. And one of the thing about governance, my wife has uh, been on the board of this uh, youth music nonprofit called the Blue Devils Drum and Bugle Corps. And it's uh, underage kids and kids up to 21 on the road for 10 weeks in the summer uh, in buses, sleeping in gyms. And so she's been working on the ethics, you know, protocols and rules. And what do you do when this happens? And what do you do when this happens? Because she wants to leave it. And so it, she's been, you know, she's out there now in California, hopefully delivering the final version of this is what it takes when you don't have an intuitive, great manager running this thing like me, because she wants to not do that anymore. And she, you know, when, when there's an ethics violation, she gets an email at 2 a.m. and doesn't want to get those, uh, you know, and she's 72. And so it, there's a whole, it's not norms, it, it is rules. And it's when this happens, these are the ranges of behavior. And so sometimes it, it, you really need that. And those are hard to do. And it's taken her about a year and a half to figure it out because the other folks are not paying nearly enough attention. They'll just figure Rosalie will figure it out. 
I was like, no, I'm, I'm stopping, you know, I'm stopping. This is, you know, I told you in November, I'm stopping, you know, this is, this is almost February. And so it, it, rules really matter. And, and that's a thing of governance. You have to set up rules. Like, governance is used much more by nonprofits than anywhere else in business or in government, because when you get your 501c3 status, you have to say, how do you say no? And how, how do you say what you're not going to do? So every, every 501c3 has to have a set of rules about, you know, you can't have private endurement. That's the, the big thing. You can't make money on the nonprofit. But beyond that, how do you set the rules? So I, I hear governance is all over nonprofits because they need to figure it out. You know, how do they stay on their mission and channel the money and get people to be engaged? So anyway, that's all. Kevin, thank you. And thank you also for pointing to the slippery trickery around succession and keeping culture going and all of those kinds of things. I remember, and sometimes it takes little tricks. Uh, Ward Cunningham, the inventor of the wiki, uh, was an advisor to social techs back in the day, as was I. And on one of our advisory calls, he said, you know, one of the ways I get people to use wikis is I'll ask them something they care about. And then I'll go start a page in the wiki around that topic that they really care about. And I will intentionally make a mistake. And the moment they've shoved me aside and started typing and correcting my mistake, I know I've won. Yeah. And and it, it, so so sometimes you it, it takes stuff like that to to get things done. Gil, did you have a short comment on what uh, Kevin had said? Question on Stas, if I could step in for a second, Kevin, I wasn't clear about the 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 governance insight. Um, maybe I missed it from somebody who needed to get fired. And what is that? What does that illuminate for us about governance? Because that's not rules. That's something else. I mean, it might be rules, but it's yeah. Not, not. We've decided that his behavior is destructive, and you know, even though we're you know not formed, he needs to not be in the room I get that. when we talk to the lawyer, and then when we talk to the town. I get that. So the, the, the so there's a we, and the we has a certain ability to make certain decisions that affect the he. Yeah. So there's a governance. Right. You know, there, there's not a, a nonprofit corporation yet, but there's a governance process there in your relationships with each other that he may or may not understand, right? Yeah, I, I, his, his ability to understand just seems very limited. Uh, so it's just, I mean, you know, that's when it comes up, when a, when a group is working on a project and suddenly it's like, you know, this dude is gonna wreck it. So you guys, you guys are, are claiming authority to make certain decisions. We are, yeah. Okay. Cool, okay. But I mean, that, that is a governance thing. So now we have essentially a policy, you know, anxious, fear-based people who want to destroy the foundation or rip it up are not welcome. Yeah. That, that's, that's our first rule. Yeah. There you go. At least it doesn't say named Bob. Yeah. Um, Anastasia, off to yeah. you. And it's a subjective rule. Yeah. Interesting. It is. Related we, we to the After the, the call, I talked to the other woman is leading and she said her heart hurt. And I said, my, my throat hurt. I said, I don't want to feel like that. And I don't want to be the, you know, I used to be able to do that kind of force a lot when I was younger and I liked it and I don't like it. And, but I had to do it because he was tearing it up and it's like, Oh God, I had to like resurrect 50 year old stand in the breach. shit. And it's like, I don't, I don't have time for that shit. I, I don't, I don't, it's, it costs too much. Um, Anastasia, the floor is yours, and feel free to take a pause before you step in. Sure. Um, just related to what has been shared already, um, the theory of governance could also be not to instruct control uh, necessarily, but it's recognizing uh, the learning needs of, of the system. And, um, you know, as my friend Indy Johar, who is much into this thing, uh, tends to say, he always says, we're not just beings, we are becomings. And so recognizing that these interbecoming agents that we are, uh, we need uh, some sort of governance in terms of uh, human and non-human machine, non-machine systems. And this is the worldview that we've, we've optimized. And then what happens is what you're governing is a learning capacity of these systems. It's like a school, it's a nurturing capacity of the system uh, what you're telling students to do the left or right, uh, what you're creating is a nurturing conditions for, for those systems and for those interbecomings to be rich, self-aware systems. And it's the quality of that that becomes reality is, is really key. 
And so in that modality, what you start to do is you shift your theory of parliament to not being focused on instructions and policies, which are definite, but actually policies which are about advancing and accelerating the learning capacity of the systems. And, and actually, to me, this is the identification of, of the systems themselves. And on the, um, the theory of governance that goes beyond the nation states, I'm sure you've discussed in other conversations the theory of network states. And well, this opens the whole Pandora box of, of these discussions, but the idea of states not being based on geographic proximity, but on shared values and aspirations and learning capacities. So that's another big chunk of discussion. Nevertheless, I want to point it out, it is happening, these discussions are happening around the world. Question is when this becomes the reality of our everyday. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Yeah, um, we haven't brought it up. It didn't come up in the first call, but uh, it's a good concept to, to bring in as well. How to start a new country seems like the right topic for, for what we're talking about here. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, the, the, I think, most significant challenge we have uh, uh, at this time to govern ourselves, so to speak, is that we don't have a shared picture of what is reality and um, we have we allow groups to uh, interfere with our perception of reality in ways that are very uh, very uh, uh, invasive and uh, and powerful um so so there can be so the, uh, and i think govern the form of governance is secondary to uh, the need to have a shared understanding of reality. So, for example, um, you know, I'm in spiral dynamics and the color spectrum of blue, you know, is people who you know, are in religious context and uh, faith, in faith environments. They have basically um, been told that you can't trust what AI is saying, not to check it for any kind of factual things, but because AI is based on on bad information, because um, there are just as many science studies out there that deny climate change uh, or reject the idea of climate change versus those that support it. So um, AI has bad inputs, so you can't trust what it's saying. So bingo, here goes AI you know, as, as, a, a, as a support tool to define what is, what is reality. And if, we, if, if a society allows you know, to, to um, have power groups misrepresent um, what we know about the world around us and the influence factors that, that are driving um, uh, um, damage you know, to the commons, then we have really no way to to discuss you know, a a a way forward or what are you know potential solutions. So we are on the one hand um, talking about being a science based, you know, logic based uh, society, twenty first century, you know, modern world. But on the other hand, we're not. We are you know believing in fairy tales. Uh, a significant part of the population, and uh, uh, and and with that, you know, destroy you know, the public dialogue, and so so there is a whole lot more to it. Who is the arbiter of truth? You know, who gets to decide? You know? And in the American political system, which I think still think is the most brilliant political system, uh, you know, ever, uh, that is supposed to be well, it's it's managed by people is the problem, right? I mean, but the structure, uh, there, is, there is supposed to be the law, the courts that get you know, to form a platform to debate. You know, think about Darwin, right? I mean, is it, you know, is it right? Is it wrong? And so on. So, so you, get, uh, you get a public debate going uh, that then crystallizes, you know, here, okay, this is the most rational way to consider what is reality. So we are we are in a bad spot um, because we have power groups uh, with diverging interests 
um, that are destroying the public dialogue by design and on purpose. And it doesn't matter what kind of governance uh, uh, we have, you know, whether that's China or India or the United States or Europe. Uh, if if that kind of trust uh, and 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 understanding is gone, then there is no conversation that can lead to any reasonable conclusion. Uh, and so I, I I think we need to break that down. What are the components required within governance you know, to to empower and enable uh, a a conversation that can lead us towards uh, towards common um, agreements? You know? Um, Paz, thank you. And Day, thank you for, we haven't mentioned crypto yet, which is interesting because a year ago, two years ago, we would probably have been mentioning it all over the place. And uh, I think there's interesting aspects there. I wanted to tell a slightly different story to bring something else into the conversation, uh, which has to do with the, the Neobooks calls that we have on Mondays. And uh, the, on, this Monday, we were talking about a bunch of technical stuff. And so Pete and Gil and Stuart and Klaus uh, and a couple other people and Stacy occasionally uh, meet on Mondays to talk about building uh, neo books, which are uh, books as bait, meaning everybody knows what a book is. It's a cultural, a well-known cultural artifact. But the interesting thing is the nuggets that make up the book that live on the web as living objects that are intertwingled with whatever else they 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 mean they mean and so forth. And a piece of the neo books vision is that. This done by a lot of people properly could actually reshape science, education, journalism, governance, etc. Because you could begin to think together over time and you could begin to set up policy decisions based on research, based on opinions, based on whatever. But the objects would all be there to be commented on and improved on as you went through. And so we had a piece of that conversation this past Monday. Uh, and it was really exciting to me because part of the reason I'm interested in deconstructing how we think and in expressing it with one another in the commons in the space between us is that that might help us understand one another and arrive at agreements so we can co-regulate. And one of the things that comes up when you're doing this is questions of, well, how do we, and I'm going to use the word, how do we govern this space of ideas that are happen to be represented as markdown files on GitHub? And that means who gets access, what kind of access, what interface do we give people to do what kind of change in what way that prevents chaos because it's real easy for people who don't know what they're doing to just mess things up, but permits participation and the improvement of the, the shared knowledge and all of that. So there's a bunch of UI design and community design questions that come up very, very quickly on an innocent project about building, uh, rethinking how books might be written uh, and presentations and podcasts and all that, because these, that, those are all just artifacts that would come out of having a series of nuggets that are interconnected online, which wouldn't look that different from a wiki, for example. So I, I love that 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 that's kind of a like a bottom up way of getting to the same set of issues and same set of topics uh, that we're talking about here. And I'm excited that these things might find a little progress in this. Uh, please go ahead, Jake. Um, yeah, I think um, a couple of segues, bottom up and top down, is kind of where my head is at. And also, I'm gonna I'm gonna verbally use that wiki gambit, so I'm gonna make a whole bunch of mistakes and hope that everybody jumps in, wants to fix me, I'll fix what I'm saying. But um, you know, maybe I talked about it last time, but you know, working from first principles is something that we integrated into our uh, social inventors toolkit. Looking at you know, what's your cosmology? We talked a lot about that here. Is it Newtonian? Is it complexity? Is it evolution? What's a human, what's a political subject, et cetera. So the top down thing, but I just want to make a case or at least uh, an offering to think about kind of the first vision or almost first feeling. Uh, what do we want? What do we want, the, what do we want good governance to feel like? <clears throat> what does it feel, what does it feel like to live in a world where it's working? Is it, you know, a family feast? Is it hiking on a mountain? Uh, you know, like what, what is the moment? What's the feeling that you want to have? have and then working backwards what do you have to have to get there you know do you need a, you need a healthy environment if you're going to have that uh that nice hike um you need you know safety you need maybe a commensurate reality <laughs> you know, to get together and 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 travel so you know just just working back backwards and giving a call out to the feeling you want to have in the future 
And I think about, you know, it's hard to think what is what does good government feel like or good governance? And, you know, um, is it victory like, you know, in a horse race? Does that feel great? I mean, you know, for some of us, Obama winning felt great. You know, that's you know, th that's a moment. That's a feeling. You know, is it peace? Is it boredom? Uh, you know, uh, what what is it? What does it feel like? And anyway, I just just to just to anchor ourselves in that as well, because because I know for myself, I get very intellectual and I get structural and I want to think about the systems that are in place, but if we're doing it right, you know, uh, walking out of that jury room and 12 angry men is like peak moment you know, where the system is working or whatever, you know, like justice. Um, so just, I, I try to think about at least, at least, at least honor both of those things, the kind of intellectual structural things. And also the, the, what feeling do we want or what vision do we want or paint a picture of the kind of world we want and then work backwards to say, what does it take to get there? Thank you, Jake. Love that. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious about paths of inquiry into this topic. Then, what kinds of things uh, you think would be useful? Given, I, I think we've we've kind of cleared the table and put a bunch of things on it, and commented on the boundaries and the shape of the table, and done a, a lot of work on that right here, right now, which I love. And I'm wondering what's the most fruitful path of inquiry going forward. And as I said, Ken Homer recommended something that I'd like to uh, try uh, that I'll probably I'll, I'll probably ask Ken to describe it better uh, on the OGM group and then in the Mattermost channel so that we can get a, a good description of that going. But I'm wondering what else. Uh, and, and also, um, Anastasia is connected to a lot of organizations that are that are doing this kind of work in the world. So is Jake. Uh, so like like several people in this call, this is this is their gig. This is the thing they they really care deeply about. Uh, and I'm wondering what we can learn from them, uh, whether there are connections to make or other kinds of things uh, or knowledge to sort of bring into this conversation. You know, if I may just suggest something, because the problem with these spaces, I mean, not just the problem, it's also part of the solution, but I'm experiencing that there are many conversations like this that are endlessly inspiring and people are sharing ideas. Now, how do we make sure, first, uh, communities are connecting to other communities and we don't stay in one bubble? And second, what do we pragmatically do about this? Right, there, there are many learning communities, for example, I'm now part of two great courses. One is run by Daniel Pinchback. Uh, forgot the name, but basically it's looking uh, into alternative to current systems and discussing and, you know, discussing chain and discussing alternative ways of governance and discussing regenerative solutions that could lead the way. And the second is uh, Project Tipping Point that do cohorts of people, about 100 people, conversations much like this with an invited speaker. So there are many organizations creating their paradigms, creating their communities, but it doesn't seem as though there exists like one unifying narrative or like a plurality of narratives still united by a common desire to move into this direction. So my thing is how do we make sure that this turns almost into a movement of sorts or like people recognize that there is a big space to be explored. Thank you, Anastasia. I have a collection, of course, in my brain of communities trying to fix world problems, which I'll share here, which is my list of other groups that are doing, and this isn't um, just trying to figure out governance, but some of these people are doing regreening, some of them are revitalizing cities, some of them are doing a bunch of other things, but I've been building this collection for a long time. Uh, this thought I put in my brain in, oh, just 2021. So I guess I, I connected up a, a bunch of different things. But trying to figure out what, what works. And then the, next to it, you'll see another thought, confused efforts to fix world problems. And I have, uh, I guess, only one org under that one. But there's uh, some of these groups are just wealthy people who have, like, from my perspective, stupid ideas, but they've got enough funds to gather up a bunch of people who want to do the work and, hey, go at it as well. Uh, and even those, I think, misbegotten initiatives often contain a few gems of, of useful and interesting uh, work. Pete, then Day. Um, uh, Anastasia, thank you for that observation. Um, I'm one of a few people I know working on 
trying to stitch together communities uh, that don't know each other. Um, and uh, I would love uh, e either work, your, your help in working on inter-community stuff or just the communities you know of that other people should know of. Um, uh, another person who's working on this. So I, the, the way, one of the ways I do it a couple different ways. The way I do it right now is a small but, but kind of growing um, newsletter that comes out twice a, a month. And I'm looking for more communities to plug into that newsletter. Uh, we're also, uh, this, this group is friends with uh, another person, Vincent Arena, who's working on something called Catalyst, which is kind of the same thing. But um, I'm specifically working on with the people I know in different communities. And a, there are a few people who are interested in inter-community. So uh, uh, Anastasia and, and anybody else, uh, I'd love to work with you on inter-community if, if you're interested. I'll put, uh, I'll put my email address in the chat. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to to follow up with anybody interested in that kind of proactive community weaving work. Uh, I do a lot of that independently and with friends. Um, and so there's there's serious overlaps in here. I think probably, Anastasia, we were on the, uh, the same call with Pinchbeck the other day. Uh, and heard like Alastair Langer and uh, yes, and then there's all kinds I of other threads. Yesterday. That we could... <laughs> so Alastair, awesome. yeah, 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 oh, wonderful. Uh, and so then, uh, yeah, and and there's interesting stuff comes up. I mean, a part of why I dropped this three body problem in here <clears throat> is because of something that's recently come up in the hollow chain community. So it's interesting if you create primitives that allow people to establish governance. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're all going to establish the same norms with those tools. So it's like you give them hammer, they're going to build different things. Uh, and you might not always like it. And then there's, you know, kind of the question about then, okay, then what what actually goes on inside the communities that are uh, that are building these tools? So there's, there's a couple of different levels of inquiry there. First of all, how do we how do we build norms and values into the tooling? Um, uh, but you know, yeah, first you'd have to arrive at what are the norms and values. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, the, um, I've worked with Vincent quite a bit. Uh, he's in the Collaborative Technology Alliance and they're actively working on what, you know, they're calling a, uh, an ecosystem map uh, that, you know, obviously he's been putting together resources on Catalyst for a long time. The ecosystem map is a, is a little bit different iteration of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess just to, to reiterate uh, the connection that I was, uh, that I was making, uh, you know, to, sorry, uh, to crypto wasn't about crypto as, you know, as crypto is often known, cryptocurrency or whatever, but the issue of, uh, of distributed governance mechanisms uh, that could be used to, you know, to encode whatever it is that we decide is our is our culture and our and the pattern language that we're using for relating to one another and uh, um, so that, that was the connection um, with that i will drop mic but uh, once again would love to connect with anybody else doing that act, act, active network weaving love that thank you Dane. uh and i will add your uh worldwide web info in and i would, would love to know know, uh, know more and if you want to put other links into the chat please do so we can follow those uh, i wanted to add in another little bit of color, which is there's a thought in my brain that says we pass laws and impose rules when discourse fails. And I would love to live in a society, Jake, to your question, where we kind of negotiate stuff, but we don't spend all of our time negotiating. But because there are norms, Nor norms are basically pre-negotiated things that are sometimes just cultural pass downs. Sometimes they come out of uh, some problem that happened back when, and we decided as a norm to do X so that we can sort of avoid those kinds of problems in the future. One of the things I can't stand about Trump as a candidate and as president and as the potential president now is that his MO, one of his many uh, tricks is that he basically violates norms because you can't be put in jail for violating a norm. You can only be put in jail for violating a law. And so, you know, disclosure of taxes before the election. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. Screw you. And it was a norm, not a not a law. And then now there's 91 indictments. And it turns out, it turns out that even laws 
can't stop this man, which is a really distressing and interesting and like fiercely frightening thing for me. If 91 indictments can't, I can't actually stop him, then I don't know what's going on here. But I would like to live in a society where a lot of things are just talked through. And we live in a culture now where some bad things happen, some bad thing happens somewhere, and we pass laws to prevent that moment from showing up again. A baby dies in the backseat of an over overheated car or something. But we do a lot of things that are nonsensical and freeze them, pour them in concrete, which is kind of what laws are socially, instead of figuring out how do we get people to be smarter and act smarter and collaborate with each other? How do we have more freedom with one another, more ease with one another so that we can pick up when something goes wrong instead of being fearful about interfering because we might catch hell or worse? Uh, all those kinds of things are about how society works. So um uh, i'm i'm very intrigued by like how do we wish this thing would work and i'm frustrated by the fact that norms will fail under concerted attack by somebody who's figured out that attacking norms is a great great strategy and breaking norms communicates to your followers that you are very powerful which is one of the things that i think happens with the, the trump dynamic uh gil jose kevin yeah <clears throat> Yeah, so much here. Um, talking things through is great, but it's scale dependent. Uh, you know, it's what we it's what we did in tribes and villages. Um, it's uh, it, it's what we do in families, but you know that doesn't even always work at that scale. Uh, very hard to envision at the scale of a nation state. Uh, very hard at the level of cities. So I think a lot about the, the and 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 by the way, the the thing about norms is that one of the ways that norms work is by shunning. But the power of shunning depends on the coherence of the community. Uh, and that that don't work with the Donald. So there's that whole story. I don't want to go into the Donald story right now. I think a lot about the challenges of doing this on the ground. And families is one example. Uh, cities is another. Um, you know, some of you know, I was CSO for City of Palo Alto for five years. And there's a weekly city council meeting in which nine people sit at a dais with a, you know, three or four inch high stack of documents that they're dealing with that week. I mean, scary crazy um and they have a finite amount of time they always go over so they go to the meetings go till 12 or 1 in the morning and at the beginning of the meetings any citizen can come and have three minutes at open mic uh and so you have this board of directors accountable to thir to sixty six thousand members um uh you know a dozen or two of whom come and speak every week maybe on topic maybe not it's really messy and it's really challenging um and so I think about the on the ground and like Kevin, you're 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 in this too very much of designing enterprises. You know, we're looking at worker ownership structures and how do you do both the the uh, economic uh, stack and the what we're calling the governance stack of those. And it's not obvious and it's not simple and it clearly depends in part on norms, which I think depend on really clear understanding of what people care about. That's kind of a fundamental place to start and what agreements and commitments people are prepared to make with each other explicitly uh, and implicitly about what they care about. Um, it's long seemed to me that that's, you know, that, that care is one of the windows into the challenge here because, uh, um, and, you know, others have, others have more experience this, with this than me, but I've seen that when the conversation can shift out of, out of, um, political blather and ideology and positions to what are the underlying cares that are animating people to get into those positions, something pop, something possible opens up. So um, that's, you know, that's another pebble in this pond. And I just want to flag, I just came across this week from Phoebe Tickle, the notion of flat pack democracy happening in the UK. Anastasia, I assume you're familiar with this. I posted a couple of links in the chat. Uh, but these folks apparently have been successful, at least with one town council in the UK, of replacing all 17 councillors in one fell swoop with a very different people with a very different kind of approach and shared concerns and shared commitments. So something you know to add into our uh, weekly conversations. Um, Jerry, again, is that starting up next week? Uh, yes. Uh, you mean these conversations? The yeah the 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 ones you talked about with Ken when when where is that happening? Yes, so that'll happen uh, same Zoom at uh, so right now it's uh, nine a.m. Pacific will end at nine thirty so we're thinking at ten a.m. Pacific for four weeks 
on following this call. Okay. Following this call, a half hour break, basically. Uh, and then another call for four weeks just to sort of uh, take this topic and flesh it out. Uh, so I'll send, I'll put the notice for that in the OGM mailing list. And then Ken will probably explain uh, a little further about the process we'd like to use. Because uh, a piece of what he was saying was that we, we kind of need to agree on some terms up front uh, and figure that out as well. And then he had a, a, a nice way to, to step through it. Uh, Marjorie Kelly, we should bring in. You're right, Carl. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't remember, I sent, I sent the note out a while ago that included Jake and a bunch of other people who care about this, this sector. And I think Marjorie was on that list, um, but I need to do another round of trying to round people in who care about this. And, and uh, I had also asked last uh, two weeks ago, if all of you would invite people who don't look like us uh, into the conversation, please do do that if you want to join. Uh, I'll take this moment since we're on the topic, just to take a show of hands who is interested in this little sequence of four calls who would like to join in there, please raise your hand. <clears throat> Sounds awesome. So let's do them. That's a yes. And um, some more details on the OGM list. Anastasia, I'll get you on that list if you'd like to be on it. And um, let's go back to who is in the queue, which is Jose, Kevin, and Carl. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to be in on that, but I'm not sure the timing is going to work with, uh, with the follow at 10 o'clock. Um, the the thing you mentioned about norms, I think I have this suspicion that when we have governance, what we end up with is abdication of personal uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the gentleman that you were mentioning earlier, when he was younger and people didn't hem him in, not his family, not his friends, not his colleagues, not the people he worked with. That allowed him to continue to grow to be the person that he is. Um, it requires that we're responsible for each other. As some people have said, at, a, at an earlier stage, not when we're already dealing with the, the risks of, of a nation, the risks of the world, but the risks of how somebody's treating somebody else. And I think, how do we, again, go back to first principles and think about what's our responsibility as a community to each other, with one another, before we worry about how we deal with a runaway train, in the case of the person you're talking about, it's too late at that point. Nothing we can do on an on a, uh, individual level or a norms level is going to control someone who has learned by the, the people around them not to do what's expected of them because he can get away with it. And 74 years of doing that, you don't all of a sudden decide that you can go the other way. We habitualize each other through these processes. It's not a, a, a question of what we expect that person to do now. I think it's too late at this point. Thank you, Jose. I'm, and I'm curious for those of you who want extremely decentralized, very low governance systems, what you've seen that works, like what would it be like, it's, et cetera. And also I'll say, I'll say that the sentence you you said that I put into the chat, governance leads to abdication of personal responsibility <clears throat> is uh, maybe key to a libertarian point of view, which is like government should be small enough you can drown it in a bathtub and all, all control over personal responsibility <clears throat> is some form of transgression. And I'm not saying that you believe the libertarian point of view, but this is a core belief of libertarianism. And it's a very, I think, powerful and right critique of big government, where one of the things that happens is we get a big department that's in charge of poverty and poor people. And like, why should I care? And why should I do anything about poverty and poor people? They have a whole department. And look, there's a whole bunch of people who are trying to solve that problem or who are supplying them with something that they don't deserve because, because. It's like the, the arguments are endless, but, but important because as we dive into these issues, we have to find our way toward what actually works. Uh, Carl, you are next. Okay, I'll just bring in a couple things to attention. You already mentioned Marjorie Kelly. Um, then um, Jamie Joyce has been 
who's kind of in the group, but she's really got a intriguing take on things and it's about building a policy space and having the arguments and seeking validity and in, in things too. I, I brought up the bleeding game with her. I haven't had a chance to follow up, but I don't know if she's um, looked at that at all. And then there actually is an evidence act of 18 in there. Uh, Mathematica actually has an amazing blog. You can <laughs> set a timer if you go on the site because you can all of a sudden it'll be four or five hours later. So just want to bring those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great. Uh, Dave then Kevin. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, I uh, stuck in a link to Jen Polka's book, uh, Recoding America. And one of the things that I heard, I haven't read the book, of course, but I had did listen to her on some podcasts. Uh, and she made this distinction between intellectuals and mechanicals that I I hadn't, again, had never grokked before. I think it, it, was, it was helping me understand the problem with technocrats. But if you think about the U.S. government, right, we have Congress write these complicated bills and then we toss them over the wall to the executive branch to implement them. And you can imagine all kinds of problems with that because you just don't know what's going to happen in the implementation process. And the executive branch is in traditionally kind of fudged things a little bit to try to make things work. But they're not really authorized to do that, which we're seeing play out in the Supreme Court right now, right? I mean, this is a lot of the battle that's going on where the executive branch isn't allowed to make decisions if the new Supreme Court decisions come through the right way. Chevron. So say it again. Chevron deference is on the court docket right now. Right. So this is the battle. And so but the notion was that the notion was there were smart people making decisions and there were dumb people implementing them. Right. The intellectuals versus the mechanicals. Right. And and I think that's pretty deep into a lot of our thinking and a lot of our governance structures. And, you know, one of these things is like, I, it's like, oh, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's just deep in my head. Um, and so and it doesn't work very well. Right. We need a we clearly need a much more agile strategy. Thanks, Dave. Um, also, all these governance questions resolve back to things like, do you want to be in an LLC, an LCA, a C Corp, an S Corp, a what corp? You know, uh, all those different kinds of questions are the functional, practical ways that we make decisions like these. And then regs are hoisted on top of all those. Uh, Carl, you still have your hand up. Uh, so do you, Dave. And I'm going to go to Kevin, then Gil. Uh, Kevin, you're muted. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that it was said in this space that Donald Trump is not subject to law and that he can uh, ignore norms. You know, the latter statement is true. The other statement is not true, and it shouldn't be accepted as anything like uh, a fact. Or you know, he, The law is grinding toward the little motherfucker. <laughs> and, you know, he, he has committed crimes. There are people who are, you know, they're moving upstream. He will be subject to law. Yeah. Buying into that Trump is is immune is buying into what he the way he wants you to think. And so I just want to say, no, he he we, it has not been proven that he is not subject to law. Uh, I, I don't know if that was my comment or not, Kevin, but my my it's not that he's immune, it's that he's very good at manipulating a system. Yeah. There's a thought in my brain that Trump is a weeble. Is a what? Is a weeble. Like weebles wobbles wobble, but they won't fall down. Like yeah. he 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 can get knocked over, or he the other one is the punch the punching clown is the other. Yeah, analogy. I mean, you know, that's another metaphor of his immunity, and it's just not helpful to bring out these things of immunity around Trump. Okay. He is not immune. The law is coming. Kevin, there's no implication of immunity in that, just of, of slipperiness and wiggliness. And yeah, and, I don't know. And, okay, I I think it is because when you say they wobble and they don't get knocked down, he is going to get knocked down. He well, is well, going okay. to be subject to law. At some point, somebody runs over the weeble or the punch clown gets perforated and suddenly deflates. So it's not meant to be an analogy to imply immunity. And I hate I hate okay. the notion of immunity. So I'm I'm with you entirely on this, Kevin. Okay, great. He will, uh, be, he will be subject to law if he gets convicted before he's elected. And then it gets very, very weird. Um, but uh, and, you know, we need to recognize that we are in the grips of a massive amount of spin every day and people are working really hard to shape interpretations of what's going on. Um, this is kind of a sidebar, but I we, we I was watching MSNBC after the um, Iowa caucuses last week. 
Uh, and I, you know, th that's where I hang. Uh, but I, I like, I had to shut it off in frustration because the amount of spin was just uh, was unrelenting and nauseating. It was like working really hard to shape an interpretation of Biden victory out of the out of the Iowa caucuses. And I flipped to Fox, which I hardly ever do, and it was the same shit from the other direction. I mean, they they felt so isomorphic to me, I couldn't stand it. Um, that's not why I raised my hand. Why did I raise my hand? Um, damn. It'll come to you. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the um, the intellectuals versus mechanicals bullshit. I really want to hit back on that because the the meme that people in government are dumb, or the people in the executive are dumb, is 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 false and offensive, in my opinion. Uh, I've worked in state government. I've worked in local government. I am consistently impressed by the intelligence and commitment and dedication and skill of the people in those positions, not universally, but a lot, uh, and not universally dumb shits. Uh, the structures are, are bad. Um, they, you know, they cause the kind of problems that make it look dumb. Uh, but, you know, um, imagine where we would be without those people doing what they do. Again, in defense of myself, I did not say they were dumb. I said the system is structured so that there are people who make decisions and people who implement decisions. And yeah. that's a very old structure, right? Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, and that, and it, it, it may, it dumbifies people because it I, takes I, away autonomy from the implementers. I, but I, it's only in the implementation process that you actually address the issues that come out in the failures of the planning process, right? So it's a very waterfall system. Yeah. And it's structured around a, and a, a concept, which is there are smart, capable people and then there are implementers. But I, I didn't say that was true. I just said that's the way we built it. But, but what, what you did say, and maybe you weren't saying your own opinion, but somebody else's, is that the implementers in the system that makes them dumb are dumb. And that's not been my experience. Uh, and the waterfall... No, they have no autonomy. Well, no, they actually... That's an overstatement, David. They do. And the waterfall has 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 gates and dams in it. So... At the level of staff, within the directions and the policies, there's a lot of autonomy about how to do. There's interaction between staff and and their and their bosses, and there's interaction between them and their and the folks who are setting the rules. Now, obviously, very different in the federal executive and Congress than in a city with a city council, uh, but it's a much more dynamic uh, and uh, non-stupid process than what I hear you suggesting. And I say that as somebody who is enormously frustrated with working in it because I felt the handcuffs, um, you know, and including things like, you know, like two year planning cycles about technologies that have six year lifetimes, like, holy fuck, what do you do with that? Uh, so it's, it's a mess, but it's, um, you know, we, we have, speaking of memes, we have pretty widely been swallowed by the Ronald Reagan, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you meme. And so you hear that even from the left these days, it's, it's sort of become, you know, speaking of norms, that's become a norm background that the government is inefficient and wasteful and all this stuff and bad and oppressive to you as opposed to government is, is the expression of what human beings come together to decide to do for their common welfare. Um, and so enough of my rant, thank you. Um, thanks Gil. Uh, I wanted to bring in and sorry i can't resist but the i hope this video is still at the link but here's ronnie reagan saying the nine most terrifying words in the english language are i'm from the government that i'm here to help um which we've mentioned on a couple ogm calls in the past because i've got it linked to them and i wanted to bring in day was they put some comments in about a project he's working on on purpose-driven startup founders and how to preserve that and i I wanted to bring in Jordan Sukut, who's a member of the broader community here, hasn't really been on any of our Thursday calls, but Pete and I have done a lot of stuff with him. He knows that some of the rest of you. And he is a big fan of steward ownership. And the big open AI kerfluffle that happened was a big disaster, in my mind, my own spin on it was, it was a disaster of steward ownership in that. OpenAI was intentionally structured as a steward-owned thing. There was a nonprofit that owned all the shares of OpenAI, but then there were all these little sub-funky companies. And then all the people who really believed in the mission seemed to leave and create another startup called Anthropic that still has that mission and that structure. And then we watched over a very dramatic weekend, 
as Sam Altman basically left and came back into situation normal while kind of shedding off the cloak of the noble purposes that the whole thing was was framed under at the beginning is what I think happened. I think that that basically through crazy, very public uh, thrashing, uh, they shook off their social purpose in 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 some way, and I'm happy to entertain other reads on on the situation. But uh, I think steward ownership is an attempt to create a governance structure and a legal model that will resist the courts, that will resist takeover, and all that kind of stuff. And I think it, it kind of, in some sense, failed. Then, Gil, briefly, then Day, briefly. Uh... Uh, open AI, and maybe this is the general issue of steward ownership, but in the case of open AI, the stewards were not accountable to anybody. And this, I think, is a common problem in not-for-profit organizations that the boards self-replicate self and are not accountable to anybody. So you lose the checks and balances that the founders, bless their hearts, we yell at them a lot, but the founders built into this system. So if the ultimate structure of uh, steward ownership is that the the nonprofit owns all the shares of the for profit, therefore is entrained to the goals and mission of the nonprofit, which is good. That's a good thing. That means that the board of the nonprofit is the end point. There is no other higher authority. What kind of regular, uh, whom should they be responsible to? What would you add to the structure? That's, that's a really important question. In the fifth sacred thing, the way Starhawk did it was that the, the town councils had people who were representing the redwoods and the salmon um, and, you know, and the soil. And there was a cultural accountability, if you will, that people knew how to step into that role and be that voice. Um, the, the, any system where the buck stops, you know, with a not-for-profit board that's accountable only to itself is cybernetically really dangerous. Uh, plus, um, if that's the case, and this I think is a question with, 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 with the, ho the whole employee ownership universe as well, is how do you evolve? under changing circumstances and stress. And that adaptability needs to be there in systems. And I think we're, you know, it's it's one of the challenges to figure out how do you have, how do you have the the uh, agile adaptability um, in a broadly democratic or consensual or cooperative structure. So Marjorie Kelly, whom we've talked about here, uh, I think has written a lot about Mondragon and cooperatives, and uh, she has a book called Owning Our Future, The Emerging Ownership Revolution, which I recommend. Uh, I'll see if I can't get her on our calls coming up. Uh, and she's uh, the five core elements of generative ownership design as a piece of that book. There's a, a bunch of interesting things in it. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of people who have dug really hard into this topic, and we should try to bring their wisdom into the conversation. Mondragon is a sterling example, and Mondragon has executive layers. They're elected by the workers. So the layer, the board is accountable to the employees. The board hires the executives. The executives manage the employees. The employees elect the board. So there's a yep. trust in the system. And when, and when pandemic hit uh, or when slowdowns happen, they don't fire a whole bunch of people. They take a voluntary, they, they will do things like take a voluntary pay cut across the board, and then they'll take people who are idled because you shouldn't be making more widgets if there's no demand for widgets, and they'll put them into training for the next thing coming down the road. They'll invest in them instead of firing them. And it's just really interesting, you know, all these practices and how unusual they are for capitalist ways of doing things and how allergic capitalism is to sensible things like that. So one of the I, two questions I would caution us on that only because they also go on strike. Yes. So <laughs> they're big. They're big they enough. The owners they also don't like the system well enough that they resort to striking. So there's yep. there's accountability. So that's one of the two questions that I'm living with these days, Jerry. Is why isn't there a Mondragon in America? Uh, there are many cooperatives, just not as big or as famous as Mondragon. Many cooperatives, there's nothing like Mondragon in America. Yeah. No, it's a, a that's nut, true. That's a nut that I've been chewing on a lot these days. I think it's inhospitable territory. Sorry, Dave, you've been patient. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, no, I, I actually really deeply appreciate everything uh, that you were bringing into the conversation, Gil. And uh, yeah, that was a that was actually a good dialogue. So no no problem. Uh, yeah, I guess what I just wanted to say about there's a lot of takeaways. I, I think the OpenAI situation uh, is actually really informative and instructional as a kind of a counter example, obviously. Um, and, uh, but like, what, what are some of the takeaways? Uh, Gil, you named some of them. And I think, you know, the methods of appointment and uh, uh, on the board, the methods of appointment and removal on the board. Uh, so th there was originally an eight person board 
Yeah, but there was actually no direct correspondence between those board members and uh, and stakeholders that might have represented this lofty purpose. Um, you know, uh, much less that there were any mechanisms in place for those stakeholders to actually act upon. Uh, you know, making sure that the board was constituted in such a way that it was actually representing those stakeholders. Um, then, you know, beyond that, uh, yeah, they were actually, as I understand it, there were not all of the board members present at the time. <laughs> there were originally eight and there were four or something like this. And the other thing that was actually really interesting is uh, is incentives misalignment yet again. <laughs> incentives misalignment strikes again, which is interestingly, we think of worker ownership as being a good thing and it is generally a good thing and I'm, I'm not speaking against it. But if the economic incentives of the workers are aligned with the profitability of the company, like if they have sh shares of, of this, uh, then that actually aligns them in many cases with the pursuit of profitability of the company. And so if you have your anchored your purpose outside the company, your purpose is, is, is kind of for the good of humanity, but then your incentive structures are like, oh, you know, actually it'd be great if this blew up so that we could all get rich. Um, then, you know, this was a part of the problem. The threat of Microsoft to take all of the workers wouldn't have worked if the workers weren't, you know, fundamentally misaligned. Um, so, I mean, those are two problems. But but then you notice in that play, I mean, uh, another thing that was wrong there is that instead of having, you know, if, if you were going to have 51% owned by the nonprofit and 49% owned by various other people or entities, that would be one thing. But pretty much Microsoft is holding like 49%. Okay, that just is a little too close for comfort. So having an outsized stakeholder, like a uh, you know a stakeholder on that side, is is problematic. And then ultimately, it's like, well, okay, there were probably problems with this way that they set up the actual structures and the lack of certain structures, as has been pointed out. But really, key insight is that if you only are looking at what you're setting up on the inside of a, of a set of structures, and you're not looking at how does what you've established withstand pressures coming from outside, right? So there's pressures coming from outside whatever you set up. And, and it has to be thought about in advance how you're going to respond to and deal with and adapt, uh, uh, Gil, as you pointed out, to you know, shifts and changes in the pressures uh, coming from outside whatever structure uh, you've established so that it's more resilient and the purpose is more likely to be adhered to. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and I know I've had the mic for a while, is, you know, th this concept of like a perpetual purpose trust is, you know, largely premised on the idea that the purpose can be well articulated. And one of the, one of the challenges with that is articulating it really well um, and can you articulate it really well in a way that that doesn't become just uh, hand wavy and abstract, where it's actually clear enough to be uh, enforceable uh, by some set of mechanisms, hopefully that are established, um, but where it remains, uh, yeah, adaptable, that it can grow and evolve and and uh, and and learn and be a living system. So uh, I, I think with that, I will uh, drop mic. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. That's super, super interesting. We're at time now. I wanted to say something and then we'll go, Kevin, and I think we'll wrap wrap the call. Uh, the thing I wanted to talk about came up as Dave was talking where I was realizing there's kind of this weird roundabout. And I'm, I'm going to say something I think most of you have seen before, but it was just lighting up in my head, which is um, when some interesting new idea shows up a lot, and Silicon Valley gets wind of it, they pour enormous amounts of money into it. Think Facebook when it's founded. Uh, think Uber when it's founded. And that amount of money can basically eat the world and plant the company all around the world and create uh, dynamics that make it the thing to dislodge, which is really, really difficult. Other efforts to create co-op-based ride-sharing, for example, there was a thing called Radio Cab or something like that. Uh, there, were, there were a bunch of little efforts to try to do ride sharing in a co-op basis where the actual drivers would own the company and blah, 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 blah. They got nixed traction, no traction. They couldn't figure out how to stay in the game. And the distributed open platforms like IndieWeb uh, and Fe the Fediverse that Pete and I and a bunch of others on our standing calls every week uh, bring up over and over again and try to figure out how to use, how to go in there. 
they can't take over because they can't get polished enough and popular enough. And they certainly can't get any marketing dollars to go get people to use them. And my wish is that they would be good enough to be contagious and viral and would just take over through virality. Uh, I'll point out that instant messaging ate the world with zero marketing dollars. Uh, the original IM companies uh, had no revenue model. Nobody was being charged for them, but they also had no marketing budget. Uh, and all of a sudden, everybody was IMing everybody because it was completely useful and contagious. So that's some kind of a, a proof point that contagion like that might actually work. But I, I don't like this circularity because what we end up with is platforms that have addiction built into them that we can't dislodge. Should Facebook ever get found guilty of antitrust, my remedy for them would be force Facebook to redesign itself around citizens instead of consumers, which would mean dropping the ad model, which would probably mean charging for admission, which would mean a bunch of other things, but that would cause a thoroughgoing redesign of the platform instead of what they've got and what we've done, which is uh, alongside TikTok and everybody else seems to be eating our collective brains. Uh, Kevin, you've got the last word and then we'll close this call. Uh, in the chat, uh, I, I posted a really good report by Transform Finance on alternative ownership structures. People who are doing a lot of this stuff are really studying a lot, and it'd be good to see what the people who are doing it and experimenting with it. Oh, so, yeah, Dave is, was pointing to the same kind of thing. I mean, and there there are things you can build into funding, like we're setting up a uh, working with the Chamber of Commerce here, and they're going to do it in a in a calm structure, which just means that you only get three X on your money. You can you can put in all kinds of controls, and that's the governance around how you finance and how you run an organization. So that report is really good. Uh, if you can't see the link, it's anyway. It's Transform Finance Alternative Ownership Structures. Really well done. Thanks. Thank you. I've got it open in my one too many tabs from this call. Uh, I really appreciate that, Kevin. No. Thank you all for being here. We don't have Ken and I didn't prepare a poem, so we don't have a poem to take us out today. I'm hoping Ken gets better uh, quickly and we'll see you all uh, next Thursday for a check-in and then next Thursday at 10 for the first of four calls on this topic. You'll see more about that from me on our lists. Um, anything else? Any last words, last thoughts? Thank you very much. This, is, this was awesome. Really appreciate it. More soon.